Hi, Henry Tugendhat from the Institute of Development Studies. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I really look forward to reading the book. Um, I just wanted to push you a little bit more on um, uh, Mariana Matsukatu's work that Rafi Kaplinsky mentioned. Uh, when you were talking about the state, I got the impression that you were mainly talking about state-owned enterprises. Um, and uh, I didn't um, pick up uh, um, any mention of Chinese development banks, I mean, the, the biggest of which is the China Development Bank, but others like the Agricultural Development Fund and whatnot that were set up in the early 80s. Um, was this because um, uh, you don't think they played much of a role in the innovation story? Um, or do I have to read the book to find out where they fit in? Okay, thank you. Uh, Giles? Hi, uh, Giles Mohan from the Open University. Um, thanks, Shalyn. I will, I will buy the book, although I could just sneak Rafi's and, uh, and read that. Um, I, thought, I think the, the idea of the outward, uh, the open innovation system was, is really useful. Uh, you kind of alluded to, but I'm not sure whether it was part of that. Is, you know, in, for example, thinking in, say, the oil sector, there's, 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 you, you were talking largely about inward FDI coming in and technology transfer occurring, but are we now seeing, as, as China internationalizes through its going out strategy, kind of joint venturing as a way of also now tapping into technology transfer kind of offshore, if you like. So I think in the oil sector, you know, deep sea drilling, the Chinese can't do it. So they, they, they've been joint venturing f for various reasons, I think, risk minimization, all the rest of it. But it's a way of, it's kind of open innovation but in a kind of different direction now. And I wondered if you could just comment on that. OK, thank you. And Tembo from the China Development Bank. Hi, my name is Tembo Ho. I'm a well, until two weeks ago, I was a, re a member of the research staff here at uh, you know, ODI, and now working uh, for the research department at Bank of China in the city of London. Um, my, my sort of comment slash question is whether we can sort of turn the debate sl slightly more from a sort of China-focused angle to a more sort of Africa-focused Africa -focused, um, context. And, and the question is sort of we have heard um, Professor Fu talking about his, her, her research in terms of Chinese, you know, Chinese innovation. But when you're a small African country that can't exchange markets for technology, don't have strong institutions, don't have sort of um, effective uh, civil servants, and are very prone to sort of cyclical electro electoral turbulence, sort of what are the quick wins that can sort of really have the lighthouse effects like China had? I mean, what I've heard a lot this morning is that China had the success has had lots of success on its path into innovation. But what are the real lessons uh, that, that Africa uh, can do to help its growth? For example, thinking about what can really put into the Tanzania's next five-year plan, for example. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So these are sort of three uh, sort of wide-ranging topics um, um, and, um, and, and bringing us sort of also to the core of, uh, of some of the issues here. Um, would you like to sort of uh, sort of comment on on, uh, on these questions and maybe some of, take some of the others as well? Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, <coughs> Rafi and Deborah for very insightful comments and also thought-provoking uh, um, uh, ideas. And also thanks for the the, the, the participants for for very interesting questions too. Uh, I think you raised very important ones. Um, I, I will pick up uh, some of the issues. First is about uh, what Rafi mentioned about the role uh, of labor in the process. Yeah, I think this is a very important uh, issue that I, I think for my next uh, research, uh, I would like to place more emphasis uh, on about labor skill uh, upgrading uh, in innovation and also about the impact of innovation on employment, on job creation, uh, on, uh, on inclusiveness. I think these are the two sides. And nowadays also we have seen um, robots come up as a hot topic. And uh, also we have seen replacing labor, you know, use machine, replacing labor use another trend, possible trend is used in robots. Uh, and uh, this is also a very serious issue I think we need to consider uh, very carefully, especially for countries with a large uh, po reservoir of population on skilled labor, uh, the social consequences, and what we should favor, you know, labor uh, uh, or capital. Um, I think that's a very important area I, I would like to, to explore further. And also for China is looking at the, the, the numbers, 
the percentage of uh, you know, people finish nine years of education, finish uh, uh, middle school or even uh, uh, university, a third degree, the, num the, the, the figure is not bad. It's good. Uh, however, for China also is the, the, the quality issue, the creativeness issue. That's a fundamental issue for China, that which really need long um, major reforms and the long terms of efforts. Probably, I think that's too fundamental and uh, very important. Um, so maybe I, I, I think I, I haven't put it as the, the top things for me to, to first things to solve. But I think also is a, a very important issue to 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 uh, to explore about the quality of education and the labor skills and the creativeness. And also, I want to um, touch a quite sensitive issue about the role of uh, defense and, uh, and government procurement. In innovation, in the world of innovation, not only in developing countries or China, but in the world, um, public government procurement is a very important uh, pull force, you know, pulling force for innovation that induces innovation and the resources to, 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 towards that direction. Uh, it has been an important driver for, for innovation. And uh, the same uh, in, the, in the US too, and the, 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 the use of military uh, demand from the military uh, development, which also have re has allocated resource to this area. However, I think um, something we need to, uh, need to, we can learn is how to use these technologies developed for military uh, uh, objective, for civil, for economic uh, uh, purpose, for economic development, for production. Uh, there are also good examples uh, in the world, like from NASA's uh, technology, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the creation of internet, computer, uh, uh, super computation technologies, all this originally also uh, was driven by the demand uh, from military use. I think. So this is uh, an area needs to be carefully watched, but I think there are good sides, depends how we use it. Although I won't enter into the other uh, um, uh, issues of the political issues uh, here. Um, so I, I, I think this is not an area we, we should uh, you know, escape or, or avoid. Um, it has been, um, you know, in, in, in for innovation, uh, government procurement uh, uh, has been an important factor and uh, the key is how to use it, and also for 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 the to use it for society and for economic uh, um, development. Um, and also, I, th I think I also thank uh, Deborah for the for, for the very insightful comments, especially linking this to reflect on how um, China's experience can offer to Africa, and uh, the, what kind of you know uh, uh, goods foreign firms that Africa should attract, and also what kind of technology um, African countries should you know, target to, to acquire. Um, actually, there are lessons from China to learn from it. Enclaves, you know, multinationals could be enclaves. Uh, either they are in enclaves such as export ex uh, processing zone, or they are in, in the society, but they have no linkages to the rest of the local economy and society. Uh, again, in fact, it is, a, it is an enclave. In China, there are such enclaves too, especially those in the processing in uh, uh, trade activity. They import spare parts, assemble it, and then re-export it. So limited linkages to the rest of the economy. Uh, I think that is the, 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 the type of um, uh, uh, goods that uh, African countries should think very carefully about the costs and the benefits and look at what China's lesson. Um, because this type of uh, goods could be, you know, wear a very colorful clothes, you know. This helps you to enter into the uh, global value chain. You're part of the processing uh, 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 process or assembly process. But what you can really learn, like in the electronic industry, um, more than 95% of China's exports of electronic products, like computers or, or laptops, are produced by foreign invested firms based on processing trade. 
So even now, in in China, most of them are based on, on you know uh, processing uh, uh, trade. All the key technologies are not owned by Chinese firms. So relying on this to to, to multinationals to to uh, uh, learn to catch up in the high tech sector is uh, would, uh, is possibility is very very low. So think about what ty type of uh, goods and the the experiences suggest is not. The technological gap between the local firms and the foreign firms is kind of uh, um, inverted U shape. Uh, uh, it's inverted U shape. So it's a moderate uh, technological gap rather than too much uh, advanced than, than local firms. Like we have the space shuttle technology for an African country, it's too far to learn and to absorb. Um, so. That is about what type, and also what type of technology. And my research in Africa also find out the DILIC project, which is also under the uh, DFDSRC program, is find African firms are innovative, are creative. However, that's most are cre incremental innovation taking place, allow them to survive and to grow at kind of um, within the constraints. Um, however, we haven't seen that kind of technology which can make a structural change and move the African countries to the frontier. Um, there are two issues uh, there. One is technological capabilities building is a um, path-depending, is a path-depending accumulative uh, uh, process. So we need to, to realize this. Um, and of course, this doesn't mean uh, we should be very, you know, look at very passively at the, the, the resource-intensive, uh, unskilled uh, industries. So it's make a realistic objective, which an African country can reach. Um, and, uh, you know, um, looking at China's development, starting from labor-intensive industry, uh, textile, high-tech, and redistribute uh, the income from this investing labor and in, in, in other uh, sectors and gradually moving up the, the, the ladder. Um, so I think I, I, I really agree with you that multinationals, uh, government trade policies, industrial policies should be designed to more selectively attract uh, the industries that you know meets the, the, the national strategy. Uh, there is a role that the, the, the uh, trade policy can play in attracting you know the type of FDI multinationals and technology that a country needs, and also you know preventing some dirty, uh, especially those dirty industry or those uh, uh, multinationals have negative social. Uh, Maybe you could briefly also take up two points. Oh, and yeah. I'd also like to bring in some others as well. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, and about um, the role of other uh, sectors of the state. Uh, the state-owned banks and also China's development banks, they, they, they did play a role uh, in providing support. Uh, however, uh, especially the state-owned banks, they have gone through the reforms. Uh, so they are enterprises, they are listed, so they, they are also now chasing profits. So for in innovation at early stage, which is very highly risky, the banks uh, show not uh, by their kind of duty. They should be responsible for, for, the, for, the, for the customers' deposits, not invest their money to very highly risky activities. They are not involved. But for later stage commercial uh, ac commercialization activities, they did involve. I, I think especially Chinese state-owned banks, they are linked to the state-owned firms. They sometimes did make you know, uh, commercial decision, uh, and sometimes did make decision is more you know, for, for, the, for the, uh, the state or national goal uh, instead of a pure commercial uh, consideration. And about Zhao's uh, um, uh, question about the oil companies, yes, Chinese firms are now acquiring technology through overseas develop, uh, uh, investment and uh, acquire technology like in the UK and build up their capability and later this can reverse transfer back to the, to the headquarters. This has been a very important strategy objective. Uh, and, uh, and the Jimbo's question about uh, a small, fragile uh, uh, African country. Um, I think China did benefit from a large domestic market. 
that gave it the advantage to experiment and scale up a lot of indigenous technologies and then uh, compete in the international market. So for African countries, first, I think they need to, I, my recommendation is not to do everything. Choose the, the, the industries that they are most likely to succeed. Um, they, have to com they have the comparative advantage and the move, you know, they have some control, some advantage there. Uh, and move along the value chain to higher value or added part of that uh, industry. And, you know, use all their resources to one or two industries. And uh, I think the regional integration in Africa is also important to allow the African countries to, to you know, to have a larger market um, to, 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 to commercialize the innovation. Thank you very much for uh, so brilliantly responding to all the points made. That's been really good. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, a number of other uh, uh, um, people in the audience. So the lady over here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jen Leo from the University of Dundee. Uh, oh, the microphone, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jen Leo from the University of Dundee and the Center for Energy, uh, Petroleum Law and Policy. It's a long name. Um, I enjoyed your talk very much, which is very stimulating as well. Um, I just want to make the, the question brief. Uh, a point which you didn't really uh, mention in your, in your uh, presentation, but I wonder whether in your book, maybe I'll buy a, a copy, uh, about technology transfer. Because that is something since the, uh, I mean, in addition to what Giles has mentioned about oil uh, industry, in terms of renewable energy, I remember uh, attending some of the workshops, uh, we asked about technology transfer to China, about renewable energy. Then one of the points raised or criticisms raised was that, okay, we don't think we would be easily transfer technology to, to China because if we just give license to one company, you know, in a month, there are 20. So I, I was thinking whether this kind of um, situation has been improved or not, and also, more importantly, when China transfers technology in African countries, what kind of strategy uh, they would have? Thank you. Uh, behind you. Yeah. Um, this, I am Xiaoxue Wang from IIED, International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, thank you for your presentation. My question is on China's technology transfer to Africa and its environmental implications. Um, I think we cannot neglect the fact that China's technology innovation happened at huge cost of environmental footprints domestically. And now, um, in my work in Africa looking at Chinese investments, um, I, I hear often that Chinese companies are simply exporting the environmental performance and governance model that they're used to back home in China to African countries. So lack of rigorous EIA, environmental impact assessment, community consultation, all of that. And I think the perhaps one lesson that African countries could draw is not to repeat Chinese government's lack of environmental governance. But the truth is, as one of the participants uh, mentioned earlier, there is a very weak, often weak institutional governance in these areas. So my question relates to the um, recent China going global, and especially the shifting of sunset industries, polluting industries away from China. And is Africa destined to receive these sunset polluting in industries from China, mostly in terms of technology transfer, and in the context of weak institutional governance, how should they prepare for that? Thank you. Okay, I'm gentle here. Yes, tying in with that, you know, innovation depends on knowledge and technology, obviously, and on policy frameworks, but it does also depend on resources. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as Chandra Nair says, um, there is just not ever going to be possible for China to have the same per capita resource consumption as, for example, Western Europe or even Taiwan has. It's just not going to be physically possible. And so we're heading for increasing resource conflicts. And it seems so far the main Chinese reaction to that is buying up the resources of the world wherever it can get its hands on them rather than aiming for them prioritizing greater efficiency. So I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. And the other thing is looking at your comparisons. What strikes one, of course, is the, the enormous uh, sort of innovativeness and success of South Korea. 
I'm, so I'm wondering if you looked at some, what have some of the indicators been which made South Korea more successful even, for example, than Japan. In my experience, it's because they were very focused and it's sort of interesting now talking about sustainability. If you look at the, the um, funds which were made available after the financial crisis, South Korea, far from more than any other country, focuses on green, on green projects. And I'm wondering if that's a model also for, for China and whether you know, there is an awareness of that. And, and lastly, I feel a bit uncomfortable about this sort of state vis-a-vis -vis markets comparison because you know markets are creatures of the state. They don't exist without state, without government frameworks. And of course, you know, this doesn't just have to be private property. It can be various models, partnerships, cooperatives, etc. As Fernando de Soto says, you know, the, it's not privatization, but legalization, which is key. So clearly, to foster innovativeness, you need predictable legal frameworks. If somebody decides to take risks, and I'm wondering how far China is moving in creating these sort of you know, predictable legal frameworks for um, innovators. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's one there at the end, Professor Tang. And what I will do then is, uh, is, is ask uh, Rafi and Deborah maybe to, to make a, one point if you want to make uh, any, and then, and then uh, hand over to Shaolong to sort of uh, address these points. I'm Tang Xiaoyang from uh, Tsinghua University, uh, Department of International Relations. And I have uh, two questions. First uh, actually relates to what uh, this uh, uh, gentleman talked about, the legal framework. So how did the uh, intellectual property play a role in the innovation uh, process of China? Because it was heavily criticized before and even now. But actually, uh, I would like to hear your opinion. Is a good uh, uh, kind of... Uh, 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 good uh, framework, uh, good uh, uh, beneficial for innovation, or sometimes people actually have a different opinion on that. And uh, another thing is that uh, when you talk about uh, innovation, it seems that you uh, focus on science and uh, technology. But how about management and uh, market innovation? Because uh, often we see, especially in this production of uh, the <coughs> like uh, outsourcing and uh, processing, uh, f the manufacturing. Actually, the China didn't get uh, this key technology, but it's uh, rather this uh, uh, organization of uh, massive production. Uh, this uh, counts. So actually, uh, do you uh, see also look? Have you also looked at this part? Thank you. Okay, so lots of uh, interesting and important question on technology transfer and um, uh, in, in, in an environmental context on intellectual property rights. Um, Rafi, would you like to make any, any points? Uh, I'm sensitive to the time. Can I make one point? Um, we've just had three PhDs completed at the Open University looking at Chinese capital goods and their implications for employment distribution and including the poor. Not multinationals. These are small, medium Chinese firms. And the story that comes out is that the Chinese capital goods are engineering-wise inefficient, have a shorter working life, have unpleasant working conditions, but they're much cheaper and they give an entry point for small entrepreneurs who would otherwise not be able to enter into the cash economy. And I think uh, something like 25% of Africa's capital goods now come from China. It was 3% in 2001. So this is a below the radio phenomenon, uh, below, radio, below the radar phenomenon, which is unfolding very, very rapidly indeed, not well observed or remarked on, but I think with considerable implications for Africa and other developing countries. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'll, I'll just pick up very quickly on, on Rafi's and, and just to say that that's absolutely the case. You can see this in the data in terms of Chinese exports. This has been very much a, a focus of the government in trying to increase this, the amount of machinery and uh, capital goods that are going to Africa. And in my research there, I've seen not just Chinese uh, bringing this in and setting it up to do their own business in Africa, but Africans buying these. Uh, Africans buying, of course, the cars and things like this. Uh, but Africans buying, bringing machinery in from China for their own manufacturing enterprises. And I think this is something um, that's not been studied systematically either. Okay. So long. You've got five minutes. Okay. I'll be very quick. Uh, first, about IPR, I think two questions relate to this. How is the IPR situation in China? Uh, it, it is an issue. Um, however, first, my point is it has been in 
proved a lot. This is not my uh, own assessment um, because I'm not an uh, expert in, 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 in law or legal IPR law. Uh, this is assessment by experts. Um, European experts uh, uh, in IPR law about China's situation, it has been improved uh, a lot, but still not enough. Still not enough. Still some work to do to improve the IPR protection in China, but compared to what happened before, uh, it has been uh, improved a lot. And it is in the interest of China China, especially some of the leading Chinese firms, to strengthen the protection of IPR, like Huawei, like ZTE, uh, like uh, Nanova. They want to protect uh, more stringent protection of IPR too, because they are now the uh, creators of uh, uh, innovation, not only in China, but also globally. So um, this is about IPR protection in China. The second about uh, technology transfer to, to, to Africa and the environmental issue. Uh, I think China has a lesson, is a vivid lesson, still going on lesson for other countries. I think African countries and other low-income countries should avoid uh, this problem. Um, you know, even you know, you be more strict and tough and firm in the FDI uh, uh, investment negotiation and put the, 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 the requirements and the regulations on the environment more stringently. And this happened in China too, when the uh, dirty FDI seeking for the institutional, we call institutional voids, and the uh, pollution haven, and the invest in China, you know, the paper making or, or kind of uh, metallurgy processing uh, process, which is energy demanding and the water polluting, air polluting, they came to China. So my recommendation is to be more firm in investment negotiation and more, and, uh, and also improve uh, and strengthen their uh, regulation on environment domestically. And do not withdraw compromise on this front because the, the, the consequences are long term. Um, the third is about, um, about yeah, the impact of Chinese uh, capital uh, goods to Africa. I also you know, talked to the small entrepreneurs in Africa, talked to them, and they said, the Chinese capital goods machines uh, price is kind of a third of a Western uh, made machine. And they, because of the internet, they can buy online. Uh, of course, the quality is not as good as the, the European or American goods. So it breaks down after a while. However, you need to repair. But the entry, the threshold for entry is lower. So it, they can afford, uh, you know, uh, to, to buy a machine to start their production process, start their business. Although the quality is not as good, it repairs, uh, uh, um, uh, it requires pro uh, maintenance and uh, repairment, uh, but he said, I can afford and I, I can start my business and, uh, and move on. So that's um, about um, the impact of, yeah, the, 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 uh, I agree. Yeah, we should. One point yet? Yeah. yeah, just a, a quick point, which is stimulated by the uh, environmental discussion. I think it is very true that there is a big risk of these polluting industries, sunset industries moving to Africa. It's already happening. And to give an example from our work in Ethiopia in the tannery sector, you have Chinese companies and Indian companies coming in, uh, not just to move pollution, also to uh, because of industrial policies in Ethiopia. But there was a... a I think a happy coincidence of foreign aid in this instance where UNIDO funded um, at least work on setting up a, a, a group of tanneries in a tannery district and a, and a common effluent system. So they would all be, rather having, than having to do their own and then monitoring each one of those, they would all be linked up to a common system of effluence. And so I think this is much more work could be done in this area, bringing foreign aid in to this is going to happen anyway, so how can the foreign aid resources be used to, as a fund or something, to ameliorate the impacts of this? Because it is going to happen. And the, the states, I know ideally, yes, the states should all have good enforcement capacities. They don't, and they won't. So could there be a better partnership arrangement? 
Okay, well, thank you very much. We've come to the end, I'm afraid, um, uh, to this uh, very fascinating discussion and excellent presentation. I hope you've been uh, stimulated by these discussions and also that you pick up a copy or uh, uh, so you buy a copy or, uh, or, or, or otherwise uh, in terms of uh, uh, making sure that you read it from cover to cover. Um, <laughs> it's not to promote <laughs> Uh, and um, um, so, I, uh, I mean, let's just celebrate the um, the excellent research, the high quality research that uh, that you've been put in uh, put into this over the last decade or more. Um, and that's exactly what uh, what the Diffet ERC Growth Research Program also uh, wants to, uh, stands for and wants to promote. It funds high quality research um, uh, that is. Uh, that is rooted in, in good quality, but also has uh, a lot of uh, policy relevance. And I, th and I think the discussions today have shown that there are lots of important uh, uh, and relevant uh, discussions for, uh, for policy. So let us thank uh, Charles Fu and also the discussions for the, for the excellent discussion. Thank you.